for these next three weeks up until Craig Willis Jones comes to speak to us late in July. We will be looking at this little series on the spirit of the age. So just to be able to discern when we see this kind of spirit happening in the world and, and amongst us even, we're, all of us have, you know, we're susceptible to this, this spirit. But we have the Holy Spirit in us, so when we're saved, so we uh, keep that in mind too. But as we begin, let's pray so we can, you know, use the spirit to help us to discern what the truth is. Lord God, we thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit to enlighten us, to open our minds and our hearts to the truth. Lord, may what I say today um, be truthful to your word, Lord, and anything that's not, please make it clear to us all. But Lord, uh, please speak to us now in Jesus' name. Amen. So yes, we live in interesting times, don't we? We live in very interesting times. I don't know about you, but I find I'm often amazed by the latest degree of immorality that the world has stooped to. I'm sure all of us are at some point. Or some new and greater level of rejection of God and his standards. And it is hard to see and hard to accept that we really can't do a great deal about it. It might be some people might say, but you can. But no, we can do things about it. We can do little things. But on the whole, God has told us that's the way the world's going to go. So one thing we can always do is pray. We should always seek to fight the decay where we can, just in the areas that we can do, we'll do our bit. But uh, that's, that's because that's what salt and light does. We're salt and light. You know, salt preserves and light illuminates these things when they're, when they're wrong. So, uh, But we need to remember Paul's words in 2 Timothy 3 verse 1. He says here, but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy. And he goes on and on and on for a few more verses, listing a lot more things. I thought that picture kind of summed it all up. And he goes on with several more. Not Ruby wouldn't do that too much. Not quite that way. Oh, Kelly does. <laughs> Selfies are all right, but, you know, just... Maybe not quite that kind of attitude. Um, yeah, so he goes on, like I said, describing these evils. And at what time is he describing these evils? Not when he's describing it. What's he pointing to? Pointing to the last days. Yeah. So the implication here is that things will get worse noticeably before the end of the age. And I think we're nearly there in a sense, if, if not already. As in, in these times, and we see this, can't we? We see this around us. So I think it's pretty safe to bet to say we're there. And it's not just in the West either, I don't think. It's because it's a danger to only think of America or Western countries as the world. But I think it's pretty clear that the governments of virtually all the countries are leading their people down a path more like what Paul describes here, wouldn't you say? So this is what I would argue is one evidence of the working of what we would call the spirit of this age. There's lots of different phrases. So there's the spirit of the world. That's one. And there's the the age of the world, not in the sense of how old it is, but the the age of the world. It's actually a phrase in in one of the um, references to this in the Bible. And it's even if you heard the word zeitgeist, it's one of those funky words they use these days. It's a German word. It, um, it literally means time spirit. So that you know the defining mood of some period of history. So it's, it's a little more nuanced, but it's, it's related to the same idea. But whatever you call it, the spirit of this age or whatever, it has one source, which is the devil. And we always blame everything on him, right? We always blame the devil for everything. But don't forget, it's in here as well. It's We're all redeemed sinners. But, and also the fact we can blame Satan, but we have let him get, you know, let him, allowed him to do a lot of these things. But, you know, the root of the tree is from him. So, what we need to take from that, I think, is that these times today are more critical than ever that we be aware of what's going on and what God requires of us in these times. So that's really what my goal will be over the next three weeks, how we as 21st century Christians uh, can live lives which honour our God, our Lord Jesus Christ, 
in the increasing flood of this world spirit. This flood is one of the ways it's described, I think. So what kind of things do we need to be aware of as darkness increases? How do we not let ourselves be overwhelmed or scared by the challenges? And like you'll always hear from me, it's all about faith. And my true, my true faith and our true faith must be built from true knowledge. So you've got to know some stuff to have faith in, in that thing. So, so my goal also in these three messages is to, as best I can, either give you or point you to the knowledge that will help you discern between the spirit of the world and the Holy Spirit of God. Now, of course, I am very limited in my knowledge and I'm not perfect either, so I can only give you some stuff that might help, hopefully. But I'll always point you to the ultimate help, who is Jesus himself and his inerrant word, which guides us through. So that's how we can avoid being deceived. So deception is the, the name of the game for the Satan. Because avoidance of deception is very high on Jesus' list of things for us to do. And I can back that up if we go to Matthew 24, verses 3 to 4. So if you have your Bible, you can look there. But we'll be um, getting later on into the Corinthians passage. But Matthew 24. So this is his definitive statement on the end times, Matthew 24, called the Olivet Discourse. That's the, the name the theologians like to give it. Because that was on the disciples' minds a lot, the whole end time stuff. And it's like it's on many of our minds today. And I think a lot of the events, the things we see around us are making us think, you know, that kind of thing. We think about the end times more. So when will the end come? What will it be like? So it's good to know that Jesus had an answer to these questions. So this is what Matthew 24 is, is all about. So Matthew 24 verse 3 specifically about the deception. And he's, he, Jesus, sat on the Mount of Olives and the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So they're all the questions we ask, aren't they? No, sorry. So there's the question. So now we note the first thing he says in response to that. And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray. So see that no one leads you astray. So that's he says that because there are plenty who want to lead you astray. So if you're passive, if you don't, purposely work at not being deceived, you're very vulnerable. I think that's what Jesus' main concern. His heart is for us. He wants to see us preserved and, and healthy, spiritually healthy especially. Um, so the better we know our adversary, the more prepared we will be to fight. So don't imply from my previous comment about being healthy that health and wealth, that's not the issue I'm talking about. So he's very happy for us to be sick if it serves his purpose. But anyway, so we've got to be prepared for our adversary, prepared to fight. So for that reason, I thought we'd spend some time this morning going through, if, if you like, a genealogy of the spirit of this age, or the, at least the, the world, the history of it. Where did it start, and how has it developed over the history of, of our world? Because understanding something's origin can be obviously very helpful in working out how to deal with it. So of course, the best place to start is in the beginning. And I know I've been through Eve's temptation in chapter 3 of Genesis not that long ago, but I thought it would be helpful to have a quick look at that again, especially now that we're looking at it with a slightly different purpose. So just different glasses on slightly. But Genesis 3, so we'll just read through verses 1 to 5, and then we'll just quickly revisit the list of tactics that Satan uses in this deception. So we made a list last time, and then I'm going to actually condense that into three points for now. So just read verse 1 of Genesis 3, 3 to 5. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat any tree in the garden? Eat of any tree in the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So that's all we have about what Satan said at that point. But there's a whole bunch in there. And we, like I said, we sort of fleshed it out back in February. And we noted seven tactics that Satan used there. And I'll just quickly bring those up again. 
You don't need to write this bit down. If you've got your sheet in front of you, this is prelude to that. Um, the first one he did was question God's word in verse 1. He said, did God really say that? So it's just creating some doubt. Second one was to present God as somewhat distant. So what I said at the time was that he uses the word God, not the word Yahweh. Yahweh is a more personal, relational uh, name. So he sort of just used the less personal name, just the general term God. Third, he twists God's word. He said, did you? Did God say not to eat of any tree? He didn't say that. He said not to eat of this specific tree. So he's twisting God's word. Number four, he was denying God's word. He said, you will not surely die, even though God said you will. Number five, he likes to make your success and happiness the measure of a good result. So like your eyes will be open, you'll be like God. So that should be something you aspire to, uh, to be like God. That's what he's trying to tell them. So it's all about yourself. Number six, make God out to be not good. He said the way the words like, for God knows that, da, da, da. So like God's worried that if you get up to that level, you might be threatening him or something. So he's trying to make God out to be not good, be jealous in a, in the way in a bad way because he's jealous in a good way for us but in the way that he's trying to protect his own position. Number seven, make himself out to be your helper and your saviour, so Satan himself. That's the whole process here. He's trying to be seen as the good guy. Kind of like, I'm on your side but God's not. Okay, So all that is in just those few thick words that he said. Okay, so now that we've refreshed on that, let's take a different angle to last time and we're going to group them according to the apparent motivation behind each one. Or as you could, you could say, the spirit of them, since that's the theme of today, the spirit behind what he's trying to do here. So in other words, the list that we just went through is the what. So that's the list on the screen there is the what, what he actually said and what he was trying to do. But this time we'll look at the why, so the reason behind it. So why he said what he said. So you could say that the what is the material things, the actual what was said and done, and the why is the spirit behind it. So this time I'll boil it down to three points, like I said. And sometimes I can just make it three points. Actually, no, it's going to end up five anyway, so <laughs> that's all right. So the first one, Satan, his motivation number one is to bring down God's word and his character. So you can see this in points one, three, four, and six from the previous list even though I know he didn't write them down, but that's um, how he was challenging God's word and God's goodness. So he questions and he twists and he denies God's word, which is a direct representation of his character. So God's word is a direct representation of his character. There's no um, rift between what he says and who he is. They're always perfectly aligned. And he tries to make God seem petty and mean. So that's kind of grouped that all together in that first one to bring down God's word and his character. So that's what he's aiming to do. This is the why behind it. Number two, he's trying to create a rift between God and man. So once he created doubt from the first step, so he sent the wedge in with points two and six again, and point two was about making God seem distant, and six was about making that to not, be, not look good, to try and be a, a look like he was a bad God. And... Like, like God doesn't want to share kind of thing. That's, that's the issue there. So on that, on this point, you could also say he was creating a rift between man and woman as well. Because he came to Eve first, didn't he? She was just by herself and then the man as well. So he was trying to create rifts between, between people and between people and God. And number three is to refocus us on ourselves and a little bit on himself as well, subtly on himself although he likes to sort of remain a little bit behind the scenes because then he can do his work a bit better, but certainly he tries to refocus on ourselves and on our own happiness. So we and our own pleasure become the main goal, and points five and seven show that, as he makes us want what God has, and then trust him to help us get it, trust Satan to help us get it, or trust ourselves to try and do it ourselves. That's what he's trying to get us, to just take anything away from God to ourselves. And the crazy thing is God has promised us so much, but it's Satan that says we can have it now. See, God's happy to let to wait until the right time, but Satan says, no, have it now. So don't wait, don't be patient, grab it for yourself. All right, so there's the first three. Does that make sense so far? Has 
like a motivation. So Satan's motivation, the spirit behind what he does, at least in this foundational Genesis example, is summarized by these three things. I'll say it again. To bring down God's word and his character. To create a rift between God and man and others. And to refocus us on ourselves. So from what we can build up, sort of from this we can sort of build up a checklist, if you like, of things that help us identify the spirit of the world. That's what we're trying to do here. So if some person or activity is doing these things, the likelihood is that they're following the spirit of the world, at least in that particular thing they're doing. All right, so that's Genesis 3. Now let's go to the next major step in the spread of this spirit, which is to do with the events in Genesis 11. So Babel or Babel, or some probably Hebrew would be Babel, or Babylon. B- Babel and Babylon are the same word in Hebrew all the way through. It's just that uh, we tend to stick in Genesis 11 just with Babel. And all that era and everything, the tower and all that stuff, Tower of Babel. So so tell me what you know about Babel, Babylon. Um, anything you can you know about Babylon? Actually, let's focus more on Babel. That's Genesis 11 stuff. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Human pride. Yeah, all that. That's the motivation side of it. Yeah. Yep. So, who was behind it? Anyone know? Any particular person? Other than Satan? Human being? You ever heard of a guy called Nimrod? Nimrod. Um, I think most scholars sort of agree he was kind of the, the guy behind it all. Um, now, we don't actually get this from the Bible itself, specifically to do with the tower, but it's fairly certain that he did. Um, and what we do know from Genesis 10 verse 10 is that he founded a bunch of cities in the Mesopotamian region. So that's Mesopotamia just means between the two rivers, so the Tigris and the Euphrates there. So you can see that. Not very clearly, but you can sort of make it out in what is like modern day Iraq. That's where Babylon was and is, you could say, because Saddam Hussein actually has started to re, still before he died, was rebuilding some of the Babylon, um, city a little. And today you can go there and you can tr- walk through some of those, um, buildings. But that was the location and center of power in Babylon, in that Babylon, the, the, the empire it was centered obviously in the city there. And in chapter 11, we come to the big event to do with Babylon, the Tower of Babel. Babel. <coughs> now, because time is tight, I won't read through that account, but it's in verses 1 to 9 there, chapter 11. But I'll just briefly summarize the spirit behind Babel as we can figure out from the text. But first as background, uh, what was God's commitment, sorry, not commitment, command, what was his command to mankind regarding the whole earth? When he Populate the whole earth, yep. Yeah. Fill the earth and subdue it, is actually the phrasing, but yet to get out there and spread over the world. And that was back in chapter 1, verse 28, before the fall, because we just read about the fall in chapter 3. But what was Babel all about? Well, it was about the whole idea of Babel was to stay put and do something to demonstrate your own strength, like Brian said, to human endeavor, how powerful we can be. So this is what they said, Genesis 11, verse 3. Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. So that's interesting. They were masons. And of course, to burn means to bake. So really, that's that's all it means that they made bricks by putting them in the kiln and cooking them up and that's the kind of bricks they used. So they were masons. But what they said next, most likely, I guess what Nimrod probably said, as leader, showed the spirit behind it though. Verse 4, it says they said, so obviously everyone said it, but they were following Nimrod. He was a very powerful guy and leader. They said, come let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. So does that seem a little self-centered and self-glorifying to you? Yes. (laughs) Yes, of course it does. That's because that's what's in their hearts and in direct contradiction to God's instruction to fill the earth and subdue it. So after Noah's flood, you know, there's only one family left, so get out there and do it. So straight away you can see two of the three 
wire points of the spirit of the age, don't you? Of those three points we've looked at, there's two of them right there. So they brought down God's word, which is his instruction to go and do that. And they focus very clearly on their own glory and name. Okay, So there's two of those points straight away. They wanted all the fame and respect, taking what rightly belongs to God. And in so doing, they did the other point as well, point three. I don't know, actually, it wasn't point three, but one of the other points, to increase the rift between God and man, which was actually point two. Yeah. So God was... Um, they were moving away from God, you could say, creating a rift. So it looked good on the surface, you know, people getting together to work on a project in unison. That can be a good thing, of course, but the project itself was just one big get lost to God, I guess you could say. We don't need you, God. We can do it ourselves. So God kind of overrode their rebellion of his instruction by mixing up their languages. So you probably you know that story. They mixed up their languages and that forced them to spread out over the earth. So God's will be done, right? He'll make it happen. But in so doing, in this spreading over the earth now, these earliest Babylonians took with them all their pagan religion. And this pagan religion was also something that Nimrod had a significant role in because Genesis 10.8 tells us that he was the first on earth to be a mighty man. And by first, it just means first after the flood. I mean, there were mighty men before that. Genesis 6 talks about that. But he was first after the flood and he was Noah's great grandson. So it was Noah, I remember this, uh, then Ham, Cush, and then Nimrod. So great grandson. But the fact that he was a mighty man and a great hunter, now we're tempted to think great hunter just means he was good at catching deer or something, but no, he was actually a hunter of men. We find that from other writings that he was a warrior, basically, you know, attacking people, you know, a soldier kind of guy. And it seems that people of his day obviously looked up to him as a great leader. So he became the first true world dictator. So, you know, and all the following dictators sort of did the same kind of pattern, someone like Alexander the Great, you know, taking over the world. That was in his heart as well. So this is the first example, Nimrod. But more than that, there was apparently an element of godlike worship as well for uh, towards Nimrod. And that also comes through when you consider his wife, or at least his companion, Semiramis, who was originally a prostitute. Now, it's difficult to get reliable information about Semiramis. So it seems someone has something to hide here. But to cut to the chase as best I can, there's reasonable support for the idea that she was the prototype goddess, so the queen of heaven, heaven kind of character. And many conservative scholars today say that these two, Nimrod and Semiramis, are the source of the vast majority of false religion from that time on, right through till today. It was like the, the seedbed of all this stuff. But I'm talking about this stuff, I'm a bit outside my familiar territory, so I'll just leave you with those things so far to explore yourself. But just be aware that Satan is never idle in his quest to corrupt God's plan. So by corrupting the truth back there at the Tower of Babel, afresh after the earlier corruptions, he quickly spread the basic tenets of false religion around the world to bring down God's word and character, remember? To separate man from God and to focus men on selfish and fleshly gods of their own making. So those, those are three points again. So these were the basics that planted the seeds around the world for paganism in so many of its forms. Okay, so we're heading towards today. So you can see they're plotting our way towards, towards it. So now let's move right forward all the way to Revelation and get to the last couple of our identifying marks of the spirit of this age. So this is where we see God finally dealing with the rebellious spirit, So which hasn't happened yet. And now you'll see why I took you through all that stuff about Babylon, because John writes about this when he see, uh, about what he sees in his revelation. In Revelation 14, verse 8, it says this, Another angel, a second, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, she who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. So there's a hint there as to the effect of Semiramis there, because she was the... Yeah, this very much along these lines. 
Her sexual promiscuity was clearly a, a seductive and attractive example for all these false religions. They like the idea of the, the pleasure of all this stuff, so they, they follow along with her pattern. And there was a lot about this spirit between chapters 14 and 18 of Re- Revelation, actually. If you look up you know, Babylon, it appears a lot in that section. Um, another one I'll pick out is 17 verse 5, so Revelation 17 verse 5. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of the earth's abominations. Some translations say mystery Babylon the Great. That's where you've probably heard that phrase. But it's debatable exactly where that mystery, whether it's part of the title or not. But the idea is that um, yeah, she's mother of prostitutes and of the earth's abominations. Now... The reason I show you this is to see if we can fill out a bit more of what this spirit of the world that we have now is about. Now, note that Babylon here is seen as a mother. You see the mother of prostitutes. So she's a mother, which would lend weight to the idea that Babylon was the source and the the seedbed of all this rebellious spirit of the age. Not the only one, but uh, one of the main ones. But also see what she is the mother of. She's the mother of prostitutes. And without getting into graphic detail, a prostitute is someone who's not just selling themselves for money or favours, but more broadly, she's someone who is unfaithful. Uh, So to give you the idea of that, I thought we'd just have a look at Hosea 9 verse 1. God labels Israelites a prostitute nation several times. But in this one, Hosea 9 verse 1, Rejoice not, O Israel, exult not like the prophets. You have played the whore, forsaking your God. Obviously, whore is the same word there for a prostitute. And I chose that example because it gets to the heart of what this spirit is. So generally, prostitution is deliberately rejecting your original commitment to faithfulness and seeking fulfillment, fulfillment in other men, speaking at the worldly level, so the, like a marriage situation. Um, obviously prostitution can be not associated with marriage too, so it can be just simply um, not commitment at all, no unfaithfulness. So in Israel's case, that, that image is carried across, the idea of being unfaithful to your husband is being carried across spiritually and they join themselves with other gods. So let's add that to our characteristics of the spirit of this age, so the fourth point there. So it's seeking fulfillment outside of God. That's the the idea of being prostitute. Okay, so that's the fourth one. Now, back to Revelation 17, verse 5. We'll just bring that up again. Now, there is another thing in that verse that Babylon is associated with. Can you see it at the end there? Is that big word at the end? Abominations. Yeah, so what's an abomination? Any definitions out there? No. Sorry? Destruction, yeah. It's it's more to do with the effect on someone's heart. So I looked up Oxford Online Dictionary. I want to get something solid. Look at that. It says, it's a thing, I'll put it up there for you, a thing that causes disgust or loathing. So it's more the effect on someone, more, less than the, actually what it is. So when used here in Revelation 17, it points to the reaction of God to what people are doing. So does that make sense? It's, it's a God's reaction. It's saying God is disgusted. Okay, so that will be the last of our whys for, for today. We'll call it to upset God. You know, upset, I struggled with the best word to use here, but upset doesn't sound strong enough. But, you know, he's disgusted in a sense. And there's nothing a sick enemy like Satan, likes better than to watch his opponent squirm or get upset about something. So what he loves is God watching the majority of those beings he created to bear his image go completely against his wishes and degrade themselves. That's what Satan wants to see. And our sin repulses God, it disgusts him. And that's why it took nothing less than the death of his perfect son, his only perfect son, to fix it. That's what we commemorate with communion every week. But that sin is just what Satan wants to see because it means he's winning. 
at least in his mind anyway. He thinks he's winning. So that's the fifth of the motives we'll list here. And that list is by no means exhaustive. It's just the ones that we've looked at in the passages from today. And we just built it up from the specific scriptures that we looked at. So hopefully it does give us some kind of idea of what the spirit of this world is. Remember, it's the why, it's the spirit behind it. It's not just the actual things that you see on the surface. So help us to spot it when we might see it in our lives, which you know, which is very often, isn't it? And I'm sure you'd agree that you, know, you don't have to watch TV very long to encounter one of these points. In, in fact, let's let's make that an assignment this week. Uh, let's have this list in front of you when you watch TV. Turn something on at random, and see how long you can go before one of these things pops up. Maybe only a minute, minute or two. I guess it does depend on obviously what show. If it's, yeah. I'm thinking even play school sometimes it might offend you sometimes as well. But it'll be an interesting exercise in discernment. So that's one thing you can think about. It's, discernment is the the name of the game today. So, so give that a go this week if you feel inclined. And as I said from the start, it's my overall purpose in doing this series is to raise our level of discernment so we can avoid being deceived. So. That's what Jesus warned us to do, so it's obviously worth doing. So with that in mind, we'll now, in closing, turn to the passage we had read this morning from 1 Corinthians 2. Because as we look at that now, it kind of lifts our thinking above the, the muddy kind of level we've, we've been wading through at the moment, looking at all these grimy things. But remember, we can't just lift our thinking by ourselves. We can only see things from God's perspective when he lifts us up there. We can uh, have a mind enlightened by the Holy Spirit to grasp these spiritual truths. And then we can see the falseness of the world spirit that is trying to keep us in the dark and enslaved to all kinds of things. And this is the exact point that Paul is making in this section. So we're going to pick it up from verse 12. So there's, we read from 6 to 16, but we're just going to look at a small part of it. So we're from verse 12, because that's where he really gets to the point. So 1 Corinthians 2, verse 12, and we'll do 13 as well in a sec. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, like we've just been talking about, that spirit, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. So God, unlike Satan is a loving Lord and Master, isn't he? He loves and cares for us, not like Satan who wants to oppress. God is generous and kind and he wants to give us so much if we're just willing to receive it. And the first of these gifts he gives us is to, uh, to every single believer is the, his Holy Spirit. And as we see from this verse, he does this so that the rest of the spiritual blessings can flow. That's why the gift of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the first thing that happens. It only happens once. That baptism of the Holy Spirit it happens once you're saved and that's it. So without him there are no spiritual blessings. And with him, with God himself in you, then you are sealed for the day of redemption. That's one of the phrases in the Bible. You're sealed. So God doesn't make mistakes. And he doesn't invest this deposit himself and fail to collect in the end. It wouldn't make sense, would it? Once he puts himself in you, that's a commitment to you. So his children all have his spirit, and he enables us the next step of the work in the gospel. Um, and the next verse talks about that, actually. So and Paul's talking here, and we impart this. So in the context here, this, we impart this, is either the spirit himself or to the understanding of, of the things freely given by God. I'd lean to being the understanding of things. That's what Paul's giving us, an understanding. So he teaches this by the, by the teaching of God's grace. In words, continuing on, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. So again, we need to have enlightened spiritual eyes to see the spiritual truth God has for us. And he provides us with all the tools once we've accepted Christ and we're willing to receive them. Because we can accept Christ but not be willing to receive them and remain a bit in the dark. But that's, that's partly our work to, our will has to be to receive those things that he wants to give us. So that's good for us, but we find there are many people who just can't get the gospel. It makes no sense to them. So that's who Paul talks about next 
verse 14. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So this is the person wrapped up in the spirit of the world, without realising, mostly, I would argue, because some of them are even fully-fledged members of churches. But still the fruit of their work is, and we'll go through, step through that list of five things, but in a slightly different angle on it. Just, so I'll bring them up as they are written, but I'll describe them in terms of um, the fruit of their work. So it's to minimise God's word, often by casting doubt on the meanings of parts of the Bible when the meaning is clear, or to misrepresent God's character by making him out to be something he's not. That's, how, that's partly how we can see it today. Second one is they might unwittingly draw people away from God in that process and drive a wedge in between God and the person by teaching them to do this third point, to rely on yourself. That's a tricky one that we all struggle with. We want to rely on our own efforts to try and do things in our own strength, to try and get spiritual solutions to worldly methods. Sorry, try that again. Get spiritual solutions with worldly methods and from a worldly perspective. And that was, I have a, a theme line every year for the last six, seven years since I've been in, in ministry in various ways. And one of them one year was you know, trying to fight spiritual battles with worldly weapons. You can't do it. And they might even teach others to do the same. And then the fourth one. So they can seek fulfillment, or they often try to seek fulfillment outside of God by trying to satisfy their own pleasures by getting money or having many partners or uh, what, you know, trying to gain status in the world, whatever. Worldly things. And obviously it's different for different people seeking fulfillment outside of God. But whatever challenges your passion for the true God can become a God for you. And that's one thing I really try and look at in my life. Is, am I trying to get my enjoyment from other things other than God? Not that you can't enjoy other things, but you know what I mean. Number five, to upset God. And, and so this can you know, lead to these people upsetting God because they're doing all these things that are against what he wants. God is a faithful father who loves us, and if we prostitute ourselves in any of these ways, he takes it as a rejected husband would take it. He's hurt. So we need to be careful of the fruit of our, our work in any of these things because it means that we are letting the spirit of this age win in our lives and not the spirit of God. So we're being, as Paul says, back in, if you look back in 1 Corinthians 2, 14, we're being natural people. The word natural there really comes from the idea that they're like animals, reacting to things by carnal instinct, not with spiritual intelligence. And both Jude and the Apostle Peter talk about such people. Actually, as I look at it now, it's, it's not far from some in churches today. But we'll just um, look at Peter's comment on that, not Jude's one. Peter In 2 Peter 2 verse 12, um, we'll just quickly read that verse. 2 Peter 2 verse 12 says this, But these, so these false teachers he's talking about actually, these like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction. So yeah, their thinking is only at ground level, you could say, you know, and reactive. They only consider things of the world in their decision-making because they don't have the capacity to see beyond. So I just wanted to look at this verse to make that point, and that, and that is what is being made back in 2 Corinthians, uh, sorry, 1 Corinthians 2.14, um, that being in the flesh, being a natural person, they simply do not have the God-given resources to see the truth of Jesus Christ. But the saved person does have access to these resources, and a safe person is able to see more of the full picture. So we'll just finish here on verse 15, but I just need to clarify as we close. So I'll, just, I'll need to clarify it as we close. Just read it out first. The, the spiritual person judges all things, but he himself is to be judged by no one. Now the word for judge there is probably better translated discern. So I'll bring that up. 
So the idea of discern, so if you swap those words around, the spiritual person discerns all things, but he himself is discerned by no one. I think that gives you a better idea of what he's saying there. So yeah, Paul's saying the spiritual person discerns all things. So all things includes physical and spiritual things, doesn't it? So that's the looking at the whole picture. The natural person, the person who lives by instinct, is only equipped to discern physical things. So they're missing part of the picture. And in fact, a very large part of the picture. So they can't discern the spiritual person. So they can't understand the kind of things that drive us. But the spiritual person should be good at discerning what relates to the spiritual realm, of course, because they should have the spiritual awareness. Unless they they can, can be saved but not have a good spiritual awareness, that's true. But you have the capacity. And there's a very insightful quote by C.H. Spurgeon. I thought I'd bring it in here. Discernment is not knowing the difference between right and wrong, although it is that, but it is, more importantly, knowing the difference between right and almost right. You think about that. Usually you can tell right and wrong pretty clearly, but the right and almost right is where the discernment really comes in, and that's where we can be easily deceived. But so often our antennae aren't really tuned that fine, are they? We let things through that we shouldn't. We miss those evidences of the work of Satan because they're so subtle. But mostly because, let's face it, we get a bit lazy, we get busy, you know, we get a bit blasé with our spiritual battle. So easy to do, isn't it? We all do it. That's why I think it's really been on my heart for the last few months to now to talk about these things, and this is the opportunity I've had to speak about it now. So hopefully, as we all consider how we might sharpen our spiritual senses, we can be better soldiers in God's army, to use an old-fashioned kind of phrase, I think. you know, I'm in the Lord's army. We don't sing that stuff much anymore. But maybe we should. But it's my hope and prayer that for this message that and, and this short series that we become a bit more attuned to what the truth is. Know the truth and then you can see the false more easily. So as we close in prayer, let's ask God to help us with this. Father, you've given us all the resources we need, Lord, your spirit in us, your word to us, our brothers and sisters to help us. And in these days, Lord, even the internet and all the resources that we can access there, we do need discernment to wade through them too, Lord, but we pray that you bring the truth to us as we as we put our effort in to um, really listen to your spirit speak to us and help us to be able to identify those things that might drag us down, that might distract us from you. Help us to be able to avoid the spirit of this world and live lives that are worthy of the name that you've put upon us, Lord. That's a heavy calling and it's a, something that you've done for your own glory. So we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.